I'm so grateful for another day to help stimulate the mental. Time to strategize, cuddle up, where's your circle? I can feel the moment radiate through the convo. Talk is cheap, turn your faith into work. I drink my second cup and put my hands in the dirt. Two cups drinking straight drip from the earth. Caffeinated conversation, you heard him here first. Back, man, the Two Cup Cafe. I'm your host, Alan Jackson, aka Two Cups. Today, we're just gonna have another high quality caffeinated conversation. And the guest I have with me today is none other than my big brother, not from another mother, from the same mother. And for those that are watching us, you could tell because we look uh, somewhat similar, have been mistaken in public. But for those listening, uh, just buckle up. This is gonna be a great uh, episode. We're gonna talk about how we went all the way from, I don't know, California, Hawaii, or made it all the way to the Midwest in Ohio. Oh, What's up, Rich? That's a, that's a journey. That's a journey for sure. Um, I'm just pleased to be here, um, hang out with my brother, and uh, just, you know, chop it up, have a good time. Two cups. Actually, man, this coffee is really good, <laughs> too, by the way. Um, it got me, you know. Got you feeling all right? Yeah, it got me feeling pretty, like, you know, ready to go. Let your guard down, Ray, just open up a little bit. If, if I didn't know better, I think I could run a mile. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. Well, man, um, like I said, it's two cups, uh, one for the wake, one for the work. That's my metaphor I've been kind of toying with for the last five years. And one for the wake, one for the work, that's the two cups. The first cup is about your dreams, your ideas, your visions, your meditation, the things you're pondering. And the second cup is for the work. That's your implementation, your collaboration, and and uh, I've been on somewhat of a, a journey the last couple of years uh, and meditating and just thinking about um, where I'm from, uh, who I am. You know, you get to a certain age where you're not sur- just surviving anymore. You, you're paying your bills. You, your kids is about growing up or gone. You got Man. grandkids and now you kind of sit back and you got a little time to self-reflect. And that's kind of what I've been doing. And that's one of the reasons why I really invited you here because I can't really tell my story without you. You know what I mean? Well. Yeah, man, I mean, it's a lot to reflect on, man. It's um, It's been a long journey, you know, from the West Coast to the Midwest, which really, I mean, we're close, closer to the East Coast than the West Coast. So, um, yeah, it definitely has been uh, quite a substantial move just in life in general from, from coming from, you know, the Bay Area, as I would remember it more than you, obviously, because right. you were <clears throat> a few years younger than me. But... The transition in the lifestyle and and uh, the reasons behind why we even had to move uh, to the Midwest is is pretty profound to the the depths of how far we've come, you know, as a family, as brothers, and you know, in our extended families. For sure. So, uh, just for those that don't know us, um, we um, we came to Toledo by way of uh, San Francisco at the time, and. Um, we always didn't have the same last name. Um, we grew up for several years separated from each other. I got to say about seven years. Um, I went with uh, my little brother's grandparents, and you stayed with mom. And mm-hmm. if you could just talk about just the responsibility you had from being the oldest and just really really knowing, like, our biological father and the things that took place to, to make the move and how that kind of molded you to, to operate the way you did. Well, um, I think, you know, without our mom being here, um, from, from my eyesight, coming to Ohio, she, um, even she sat us down before we came here and said that, you know, we were moving, you know, that it was going to be a better quality of life here. Um, we didn't want to come, me and Michael, you know, Alan, you were too small to have anything to say about it. Plus, you came before we came anyways. Right. Um, and, you know, my mom, we were living in Hawaii for a couple of years, and she met a man in the Navy because they had a naval base over there. And um, and uh, he had given her these dreams and aspirations of a better life for her children in the Midwest. Um, and I would say, you know, after the fact, um, growing up here is probably definitely a better, it was a better um, move than us staying in San Francisco because we lived in, in a low-income area um, at the age of eight, nine, I had already started smoking weed um, on the street corners. And uh, my mom just didn't know what to do. So 
um, the best thing for her to do was to move us west. I mean, Midwest. And um, at the, you know, from the way we came out, it was probably the best thing she ever did for her family. Mm-hmm. Even though she moved herself away from her family, right? Um, her brothers and and we all they all lived in Hawaii and uh, San Francisco. So to get this far away, and she was the only one that ever moved this far um, east. So, but I just applaud her for the um, for the step of faith um, to to be able to sustain to sustain our family. Uh, all by herself because sure. once we got here, um, my youngest brother, so father, um, changed his changed his stripes. Mm-hmm. Basically, um, he went from being a you know pretty good guy because she had four brothers. So right. in California, you know she had she had family. He had none. Once we came to Ohio, this is his backyard, and you know, some dogs bark bark loud in their own yard. So that happened. So within a couple of years, she was solo with a. With, with four sons, two of which because he had became abusive. Because he had became really abusive, um, to the point where I made a promise to myself that you know I was probably around twelve mm-hmm. by the time this happened. I said, you know, once I'm gonna grow up to be a man, and and then I'm gonna come find him and you know uh, deal with it. Deal with it. Yes. Sir. So, but he also had told my mother that um, if she wanted to have the younger two right back or to live with them. That he would have to take, she would have to take him as part of the package deal. But he was, the way he was uh, treating her, it was toxic, it was poisonous to the minds of, of her children. For sure. So she decided to um, do her best. And she had told me, because I was like, Mom, why don't we just go back to California? You know, um, this this place is not good for us. And right. she said, well, I got two sons. I'm not leaving without my whole family. Because by that time, we was forcibly... <clears throat> We was forcibly taken from her by him to his parents' home. And I didn't understand it when I was small, but then when I thought about, you know, just from the line of work that we both kind of migrated to as adults, um, she grew up, you know, in foster care and group home and girls' homes and things of that nature for the trauma that, that she experienced in her life with, with her own her, her own parents. And so when we were taken, she didn't want to... Um, have us go into the system while while they fought it out, and I believe she had told you that once I I had got old enough that I would come home. Yeah, she said that. She said once they get to the age that they can make a decision that um, you guys would come home, and I couldn't believe it because you know we were struggling. Right. Um, there was times when you know we would get you know she couldn't afford to to take care of the household by herself and. We'd wind up, you know, maybe staying with some friends for a while and, right. and different things of that nature. But she never lost the faith that she was going to be able to put her children all back under the same roof. And um, it was even a point in time when I was like, I, I just came to her, you know, and this was probably one of the only times that I actually ever, you know, seen my mother's shoulders just slump. And it was, you know, it was at my own hand when um, I just, one day I was like about 14, 15, right around yeah. there. And I was like, I said, Mom, are you sure? That um, that 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 you're my mother, and you know, and she's like, <clears throat> excuse me, she's like, why did you ask that? I like, cause in my soul, I don't believe I'm supposed to be this poor, mm. you know. And it was like I was kind of joking, but I was kind of serious. But right. I figured she wasn't telling me to shut up, you know, get out her face or something like that. And she didn't. She just, you know, looked at me with like this, with like this look, and she said, you don't know what being really poor is. And I just mm. couldn't. And at that age, I couldn't understand it but as a grown man right with my own children and seeing how the world is now I know what being truly poor is being truly poor is where you don't where you don't have anybody that loves you right nobody that's going to you know defend you and give you know give themselves for you and she was that person so you know all the riches in the world couldn't have replaced my mother but I I needed to grow up to see that and but she planted that seed in me when I was you know when I had those you know uh, immature uh, thoughts in my mind. But right. I was just like, in my soul, I just couldn't believe that <laughs> I was meant to be <laughs> that poor. I was like, I just don't feel like, <laughs> like, like I should be a poor kid. Right. And, um, you know, so, and I grew up, and, you know, my kids didn't grow up poor, and I just thank God for that, first and foremost, um, because without him, none of this would have been possible. For Not sure. even sitting across from my, my brother, um, you know, because, you know, 
biological brothers, but brothers in Christ as well. And right. and that's important um, because a lot of things that happen to you in life without Jesus, for me, it would have just been all bad, you mm. know. Never, you know, what do you say? Never kept a frown when I came around. I was everything was all bad, and and that's how I really felt for quite a long time until I actually came to know, you know, um, my purpose and you know to serve the our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yeah. So you had an interesting journey as well, as far as just being like you could have easily, I guess, closed all the way down, but you find yourself, um, you know. Advocating for others. So whether it was your friends, I mean, you wrestled, you know, you was on a wrestling team. Um, you had friends. You Back in the day, you used to break dance, you know. Yeah. Back in, you know, many pounds ago, you could do yeah. a windmill, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, <laughs> and also just when you came, like, we reunited at, at the high school. You were assistant wrestling coach. Mm. You know, I was attending the school. And by that time, we hadn't seen each other for a long time. Right. And you began to just, you know, come around, encourage me. Like I said at the time, we had this different. I was going by a different last name, and mm -hmm. and like, how did that, how did that feel for you as you know, being five years my senior, you like the oldest, right? And just kind of like knowing all of our history, and me being pretty much oblivious. Well, you know, when I when you went to the same high school that I was coaching at, I thought that that was you know profound in the fact that I mean I didn't know the Lord then, but he had put us in the same in the same space, you know, on a daily basis. And then you came out for the wrestling team and I was, it was a sport that you had not um, attempted yet. You were a baseball player and a football player. But actually you, actually you came to the football workouts and you used to help me lift weights. That was yes, before I That was before you wrestled. That was way before I wrestled. I didn't. Yeah, that's right. That I took a little more uh, encouraging to go out right. there. Right. <laughs> yeah. It gave you some, yeah, I forgot all about that. Yeah. But again, I was a coach, and you were my brother. You were in the building that I um, that I was employed in, and uh, it just it gave us that avenue to to um, to touch base, you know. And it was so funny that it was sports that did it, mm -hmm. you know, um, because uh, you know I didn't have that, um, I guess that role model, that 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 older brother, you know, the father figure, none of that. So. Everything for me was for, from feel. Like, mm -hmm. you know, this is my brother. You know, nobody helped me in this weight room. So, you know, I, I've learned some things. So let me um, teach it to him. Whatever I do know, whatever I do have, you know, I'm willing to um, try to do my best to impart any type of knowledge or any type. Even with, you know, the business that we do now, mm -hmm. you know, you had no um, experience. Right. I went to college for it. You, you know, you just... You know, so they, you know, but, but we had that bond, so I, I taught you everything that I know, you know, and you took it and you flew with it, and I, you know, and now it's like, man, I'm just happy to see my brothers, you know, um, doing well in life. And back then, I just wanted you to do well. Right. So I'm like, I'm going to teach you how to lift these weights because I know football is going to need it. Had no idea that you were going to come out for wrestling, but whatever I had, I was willing to give to you. That's great. That, but that's how we were raised, man. That's how my mom, you know, she said, you never leave your brother. You know, and and from a young age, I was like, we our brother Mike. You know, he's in he's in Texas, right. and um, and she he would he was a knucklehead, so he would have a hard <laughs> time uh, knowing when he was supposed to come home. And my mom would be like, "Go out and find your brother." And I just think that was a you know that was a punishment, right? To go find your brother, and man, I'd be looking for him and this that and the other. And sometimes, and she said, "Don't come back without him." And I was like, "Man, I thought that was the most harshest thing in the world, but it did leave me." did teach me, you know, without having to go to the to the army or go to war or to be fighting in some foreign land. Right. You know, to fight here in my own backyard and be like, I can't go nowhere, you know, unless my brother is okay. And, man, but funny thing is sometimes I come home, this dude would already be in the house, <laughs> be to ate his dinner and, and mine. And, and ours. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be looking at my mom like, you know, okay, ma. You know, so... But, and I always thought that she loved him more, but you know, you grow up and you understand that, you know, you got that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, know. that's interesting to say that because I know, like, you know, we all we both have children of our own, and mm -hmm. and I was listening to uh, this doctor, and he was saying that you can grow up in the same house, but no two kids really have the same parent. You know, you think you have the same upbringing, you think you brought up the exact same, but that mm -hmm. parent has to be something different. 
for every child. And like you said, you just, like I thought she loved him more, but really he didn't need it. He needed that attention, you know, to um, to get himself where he needed to be. Exactly. Well, yeah. Well, he needed more attention than, <laughs> than any of us could give him, you know. But he's he's doing well now, thank God. For sure. For sure. But yeah. The but you know even with raising your children, you can teach your kid your kids all the same morals, um, all the same lessons. But even when you watch a, even when you, when you look at a painting, mm-hmm. you're gonna see something different than I see. Right. The colors that come out to you might be different than the colors that come out to me. Mm-hmm. So from any lesson that we've been taught or that we teach, each person's gonna pull something different out of it based on, you know, their God-given talents or their, you know, their um, the way that they process information. So. You know, that's the same thing that I think a lot of times. I mean, I, all my kids were fed the same food. Mm-hmm. They, um, <clears throat> you know, had the same sleep patterns and, and difference. But, you know, one's six two, you know, 215. You know, one's 5'11", five, 205. Two, and, right. and my daughter's, you know, 5'6". She won't tell me what her weight is. <laughs> 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 but, yeah, man, it's just... You know the same stuff, and just get something different out of it, man. And it's just, it's just the miracle of God, man. It just makes everything just so majestic. So, why don't you just tell me a little bit about your professional journey, man? Like, I know you started <laughs> off, uh, man. I know you was going to school, college back when they was in quarters. Yeah, man. You know what I'm man. And, and, and UT wasn't. Tell me a little bit about your, about your, size. about your That's journey. Nice. I mean, I can say a little bit. You know, you went from working boys' club. You worked at. You know, residential facilities, you worked at, Mm -hmm. you know, Connecting Point, you worked in uh, apartments for uh, runaways, you worked, you know. So just tell me a little bit. I mean, you taught martial arts to at-risk youth, uh, worked with adults with developmental disabilities. You know, you got your master's degree in criminal justice. Come on, man. Like, I know you're sitting over there like, you know, just a big head dude, but you got to tell them a little something. Man, look, (laughs) my education started way before college. As far as how I deal with people, um, how I deal with, with you know, like you said, at, at risk youth or people with with developmental disabilities, um, you figure half the half the people I grew up with was at risk youth and had developmental disabilities. <laughs> For sure, and that's real. I, I was in grad school, and we were watching the documentary on um, mental health in prisons, mm-hmm. and I seen uh, we used to, well, we used to call this this young man. Well, he's my age, but he ain't young no more. We used to call him Crazy Rob. Okay. You know, was going to Robinson Junior High School. We called him Crazy Rob. And I seen Crazy Rob on the documentary. On the, on the, on the, on on the video? Prison, on the prison video. And I was oh, like, man. oh, man, that's Crazy Rob. And then the people in my class, you know, they were from, you know, um, rural areas and, and small suburbs, and which that's a whole other policing thing. But And you was a little older than them at the time, right? I was older than a lot of the grad students that, uh, that were in my classes. A lot of them were trying to be U.S. Marshals and... FBI agents and different things, you know, on those levels. But they came from places like uh, Sydney, Ohio, the small towns, really small towns, and they had their their understanding of uh, inner city life was was definitely lacking for them to be wanting to go out and work in the, in this field. But grad school to try to give it to us as much as possible by making us go to missions and you know doing programming and stuff like that. But still. You know, from where I, my journey, as far as my uh, my professional life, man, I I did I did a whole lot of things um, that couldn't have been taught in a college course. Okay, and I think that's what's given me the longevity uh, to sustain such a long career um, because the things that I learned, I mean, in the streets, and without incriminating myself, um, <laughs> those that know me know; um, those that don't might not need to know. So. Um, but yeah, I, I, I had a lot of education um, on the other side of the tracks that that helped me when it was, I had no fear to go um, uh, teach in, in um, you know subdivisions of LMHA and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And and when kids would you know swell up at me, I understood what they were doing because I've been there. Right. Um, so I wouldn't react in a way. Uh, there is no way actually for that the textbook can teach you, mm-hmm. but. I wouldn't react in the ways that uh, that they thought that somebody that was working with them should. I would react in a way outside of being, you know, um, abusive, uh, the way that their uncle, you know, or their big brother mm-hmm. would, would act. And, and I had a lot of kids that um, that respected me uh, when I worked in a treatment facility. And I had I had this thing that even then um, that I learned from my mother, man, it was like, you know, when 
when holidays would come, and I always worked all the holidays, mm-hmm. you know, until my own kids got to be um, a little bit bigger. And they were like, oh, Mr. Jackson, you ain't going to be here tomorrow because, you know, it's Thanksgiving or whatever. I said, man, this place is good enough for you and you learning your, you know, what you need to learn to get your, get your life together. Right. And I'll be here for you, you know. So I was at that place until it closed. And Lord knows I didn't want to be there. But every time another kid would come in mm-hmm. and they would, you know, say, you know, if it wasn't for you, this, that, and the other. And it wasn't the pay. It was, it was never the pay. Right. It was always the the, the, the process of, of of helping an individual that might be where I was, you know, get to where I was at. See, that's what I, I think about the same thing because, you know, you could be doing the exact same thing as somebody else, but you could be doing it for a totally different reason. Absolutely. Like the things that I do now with the young men that I work with, I look at them, like you said, you know, you can see your friends, you can see your family members, you can see your brother, you can see, you know, one of your uncles, Man. all in their face, all in their behaviors. Mm-hmm. And I, when I grew up, it was like, you know, you you born mm-hmm. with your biological family, mm-hmm. your brothers, you know, but you choose your friends. That's right. And good, bad, ugly, your friends you come up with, once you choose them, there's nothing you wouldn't do for your friends. Mm-hmm. So with a lot of the young men I work with, I look at them as like they my friends. And with nothing I won't do for my friends. So I tend to find myself going an extra mile, sometimes even to a fault, you know, because everybody's not ready for that friendship. True. But I don't try to, uh, you know, I don't want to be their their dean. I don't want to be their correction officer. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't try to take the place of their father because most of most of us didn't, you know, we didn't take too well. Nobody calling us father. I mean, when I first started, you know, gave my life to Christ, started going to church, and they tell me about some, this is my spiritual father, this is mm-hmm. my... You know, some of the women, you know, call it pastor, daddy. I'm like, nah. No, yeah. Nah, you're not my father. Yeah. You could be my brother. Right. But you can't be my right. father. Yeah, me and you grew up the same way because <laughs> I had that issue too. Actually, man, to be perfectly honest with you, when I started going to church, I had a problem calling somebody brother that I didn't really know. Mm. Like, you ain't my brother. <laughs> I got three younger brothers and that's it. Right. You know, and maybe a couple other homies, you know, that, that I know, you know, if it went down that they be there for me. Right. But other than that, I don't know you, man. You can't be my brother. Right. You know, so I wouldn't call him nothing. Just I really wouldn't. Just start talking. I'll just start talking. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. <laughs> so, start so, talking. And then man. as far as the father figure, when they say, you know, he'll be a father to the father. So I was like, well, if you don't know, if you have no frame of reference of what a father is, how you already starting off in the hole, even in Christ. Mm. You know, so it takes him, himself. You can't have a, a man can't explain that to you. Right. There has to be a spiritual um uplifting to be able to understand what a father is for someone that never had one. Right. You know, so it's like they say. Because that word, when somebody say father, you can, it could be a trigger. Yeah, it could know? be. You're right. You know, just saying that, that word or just reading that word or just, you know, because once I I realized that, you know, say that the father, the guy that I was calling dad wasn't my, wasn't my biological father. Mm-hmm. And then I had no memory of my biological father, although you know, I met him a few times mm-hmm. and then just it's different. Like like just being a young man in the community, you could be like, it's easy for you to dismiss a father. You're like, mm-hmm. oh, my father wasn't around, forget him. But right. no matter what your mother, your mother could have been on drugs, she could have been a prostitute, she could have been whatever. But but a, a young man is going to say, I tell him, like, you only get one mother. That's right. You know, and that's something I've been been working on trying to understand you know like i said i've been on a journey Mm -hmm. um the ancestry you know kind of like trying to find our biological father and we wind up finding a biological sister sister. i know it's wild bro (laughs) i was like man and then you know even with that though it was it's crazy because i feel like a connection to her yeah for sure didn't even know her for 40 years right didn't know her 40 years but you know i could already say like man i love her you know yeah you know like if i seen her i'd be like you know like we 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 broke bread and we haven't right you know like we you know like i done uh protected you and i haven't right you know but i feel that like that sense of, of of kinship to her and um and that is something different man but as far as like fathers and and you know your mom and cause my, our mom was tough. Mm-hmm. I mean, she was the oldest of five, and she had she four, four little, little brothers. brothers. Yeah, four and little then brothers. she had four sons, so it came easy. And she swung, and she swung fast, and she swung hard. And um, she wasn't playing, and and we needed that. Yeah. So, but we still needed. You needed. Y'all needed a little more than I did. Yeah, we did need it more than you did. You was like, you was like the good kid. 
<laughs> I was like, this dude, man, you got to get tough, dude. You know, but you got tougher, though. But the baby, I mean, he's still, well, you know. he's still, he's still, he's still our baby brother. Yeah. Love him to death. <laughs> but, man, that dude. Man, he's just too cool for me. But um, <laughs> but yeah, but you know, and I and I find myself, you know, I've, I've been a father to my children, and that was one of my my how do you say my, my my most sincere prayers is that you know the Lord let me to 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 help me to raise my children mm -hmm. in the way that they should go, and let me you know sustain a place in the home with them and be you know the head of this household. Right. And um, me and my wife ran into an issue when I you know because right now you know our youngest son is in college, he's playing right. football down there in North Carolina. And as we were coming to his, like his senior year, you know, she started noticing the difference in me. It was okay. because in my mind, the journey was over. Mm -hmm. I've been a father to my children and that was what was most important to me when it shouldn't have been. Mm. What should have been, what should have been, you know, that that she would, she should have been first. Right. Always, not me. And then, you know, we had, I had some, you know, some animosity because I was always had a little bit of anxiety built up to like, if I mess up, she's going to take my kids. Right, right, you right. You know, if this don't go just right. Just kind of built in. Yeah, it was just like automatic, like, you know, like something that, you know, like like a, like a uh, what do you call it, like a memory card that was just inserted mm -hmm. into me that that's just, I didn't, I never knew why, but it was there. And because I, most of my friends didn't have dads, right. you know. So, so and she never had those type of intentions. She never had those thoughts because we had to have a conversation because right. I started acting like whatever. Right, you know, right. Because they, 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 they made it. They grown. Yeah, yeah, you know, I could, you know, it's fork let, in the road. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so she was like, I've been always living my life like, you know, it was gonna be me and you forever. And I was like, man. So I had to start, you know, you know, actually creating some new goals and some new aspirations for right. for my family, which is me and her now. And um, but even with that, man, um, and that was put into us. If you really think about it, when we were kids. Us and all of our friends, you know, the ones that didn't have dads, mm -hmm. you know, your mom had to be strong for us. And the, but they, she would always tell us, and my homeboys, moms would always tell them too, you know, if you if you had these children, you get out here in these streets and you make these babies, take care of your you kids. take care of your you know take care of your responsibilities, mm -hmm. you know, not your kids, but that's what was inferred. Right, right, right. <clears throat> take care of your responsibilities, and your responsibilities as a child. But we weren't raised from single mothers to to learn that our responsibility was to the woman mm. that that we uh that they we brought forth life with you know she should have been the most important person to the most important responsibility that we had but it mm. wasn't right and so now we have a, a generation a couple of generations of, of of young black men or even men to my age and I'm in my early 50s that our responsibility was to our children whether we lived with them or not when, whether we ever talked to the woman or not mm -hmm. it was to our children but you can, monetarily Weekends, special events cannot um, take the place of what that woman went through raising right. raising these young men's children by themselves. There's going to be some kind of bitterness locked into that whole situation. So if you took care of the woman, you'd be you'd be better off to take care of her, and then in that your children will be will live a happier life. That's mm -hmm. my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, no, I see know. I see where you're going with that. But you know, so I, you know, I, I think these days, you know, even if I think some of the, you know, the mothers that are that are single, then, you know, now they're starting to even do better about letting these fathers see their children. Because when, when I was coming up, you know, if a, if, a, if a female was upset with you, she would just withhold your children from mm -hmm. you. Now the laws and, you know, some of the ways that the court system is handling that, the fathers are get, gaining a little bit of ground. But yet and okay. still, the base of your relationship was with that woman. Right. So you need to maintain that and be respectful of that first. And then the children will see that. And then they will grow from that point. Hopefully, it should be in the house. But right. if not, you know, those are the things. But we learn from strong women different lessons. Right. That's that's powerful, man. I appreciate that that wisdom. I know me and you talk about that type of stuff all the time. But I'm glad our my listeners and my viewers they get the um, opportunity just to hear another perspective. Uh, just switching gears a little bit. You know, this be wouldn't be two cups without the weight and the work. So wake I just want. Work. I want to uh, see if you had any big ideas on your mind, any big dreams, big goals for yourself. I mean, man, you know, the wake for me, you know, as far as the aspirations and the work, well, the aspirations and the goals, um, like I said, I'm redirecting my life now because, mm -hmm. you know, my life was to um, raise my children firsthand. Right. You know, to to let them have a two-parent home, um, and and that journey 
it's now just, you know, pretty much complete. Mm -hmm. I got one that, you know, comes home from college. Um, he's a freshman. I have one that's graduating from grad school, my oldest, and he's at home now until he can finish grad school, which is he'll be graduating in May. And he'll, he's already started to, to talk to um, these big companies about um, employment. And um, so it's like those were my, my, my goals and aspirations to do better for my children than, than my mother could do for me. Right. And uh, so now, you know, I'm looking to, I guess, basically do stuff like, you know, diversify your portfolio, or, <laughs> you know, stuff that you're supposed to do when you got $2, you know. So, and it's like uh, uh, travel plans. Okay. Um, man, really, you know, whichever way the Lord is going to send me uh, to, 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 to finish out this, this life is basically the direction that I'm going in. But, you know, uh, as far as the work is concerned, I've done pretty much everything, man, you know, in this in this line of business mm -hmm. as far as um, <clears throat> working at the Boys and Girls Club, um, uh, instructing martial arts at the Catholic Club and at the Stula Neighborhood Center back in those days, um, being president of the fraternity, you know, once I, you know, actually shifted to being a full-time uh, college student, you mm -hmm. know, the, the Brothers of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, um, even me and you, you know. We, yeah, I was kind of like an honorary member. You know? Yeah, that one, yeah. But yeah. you was an actual member of, you know, the Amazon Lodge number four as yeah. far as the Masonic order was concerned. And a lot of those things, me and you, you know, we talked about as far as not having a father and looking for where, what is true manhood. Mm -hmm. And then after even all those, you know, um, those avenues coming to learn that, you know, true manhood for me was taught, you know, in the church. Yeah. Um, so I couldn't learn it from the fraternity. I couldn't learn it from masonry. Um, whatever they said the secrets were, it was, you know, there weren't enough for, for me to understand what it was to be a true man until I, you know, I came to know um, Jesus Christ that I would, you know, give everything for, for those that I love like he did. Yes, sir. You know, and that's, and, and that's another thing, man, in church, you know, every, you know, love your brother, said and the other. I was like, well, <laughs> do I love you? Like a third cousin, probably. <laughs> but if I love you, love you, then I would die for you like he did. Mm -hmm. I don't love you like that. And people be all, oh, Brother Jackson, you know, you know, you kind of raw like that. I'm right. like, hey, I'm going to keep it real with you. Right. You know, it's probably, now I think I can count them on two hands, the folks that I would actually, you know, take a bullet for. But at one point in my life, it was, I'd count them all on one hand. Right. And the church is a whole lot bigger than that. <laughs> so... <laughs> so <laughs> But, but, but yeah, man, it's like, um, but that was, you know, that was my journey. And then to, to continue on from there, you know, I had, a, I had a privilege, you know, working for Connecting Point to go look for runaways mm -hmm. and, um, and teenagers, you know, we went under all the bridges in Toledo and, and we knew some of the places that they camped out in high brush and stuff like that. They would have a little, they, they clear mm -hmm. a little, uh, mm -hmm. little section in the middle where you wouldn't even know that they was there unless you knew that they were there. And so, you know, I got to, to, to experience that, you know, and a lot of these kids came from, um, like, farm-type communities where they right. would run away from home thinking that they'd run to the city of Toledo for all, of all places. Right, right. But to them, Toledo was the big city because they, you know, come from these mm -hmm. outskirts of, of, of Toledo. And, um, and then it, it was kind of gratifying sometimes that you would call, the, the kids would give you, you know, these teenagers, once they figured out what, what the streets really were, that they weren't, they weren't, designed for it they weren't it wasn't taught to them mm -hmm. so they had no reference for it and they was getting robbed and you know bad things were happening but they were still too prideful or afraid to go back home to call home or go home and we were there to bridge that gap and you know I really appreciated that um made some calls to some parents over you know a couple of years that I did that and they had no idea that their children were on the streets they mm. figured that they were staying with them with the with a friend or something right. like that but they were really staying you know, on the cold bricks. And um, so, you know, even and then going from there to working with, uh, like I do now, with individuals with disabilities, you know, some of these individuals, their lives will never be where they can take care of themselves. Right. They might be able to go to the store. They might be able to, you know, to count $5 and knowing how to get proper change, but they can't take care of themselves whole, you know, holistically. And, um, you know, I just thank, thank the Lord that he's given me the, the uh, ability and the and the discernment to to be able to care for under other individuals that um, that in other terms 
might have been, you know, lost in, in, into a facility or something right. like that. I just thank God for that opportunity. But that's where I'm at, man. Okay. You know, pondering, going, you know, if I had enough to do, you know, going back to school, get a PhD or something. Oh, you like be that. Dr. Jackson. Be, you know, one of us got to do it. You know what I, mean? so. <laughs> I can dig it. I can dig it, man. Well, I appreciate you coming by, man. Um, like I said, I couldn't, I couldn't tell part of my story, man, really without. Without you being there to fill in the gaps, man, I just want to let you know I appreciate you, man, as man. a brother, man. Not only as a brother, as a mentor, you know, you as a friend. You don't even know how you much know? I appreciate you, bro. Yeah, but um, but that's two cups, man. Just two cups. Uh, just keep an eye out of uh, for our next episode. Um, I'll have more information in the in the in the description of how you can support two cups, or we got some merch coming. So just keep an eye out. And until next time, That's one for the wake, one for the work. That's why I came for the free cup. <laughs>